Welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security problems every week and to sharing some practical security tips along the way. As always, I'm your host and all-around security nerd, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting August 10th, 2015. Let's jump in and actually play back this week's daily security bites. Monday's story is a breach to a UK mobile phone retailer. First, I've been gone for a week, so sorry I missed the story. There was, of course, a ton of news with Black Hat and DEF CON having big security conferences last week, which included all kinds of interesting new information, which I'll probably cover throughout the week. But I thought I'd start today with a new breach that some of our UK listeners will want to be aware of. Carphone is a well-known UK mobile phone retailer, and over the weekend, they warned their customers in the world at large that they'd suffered a cybersecurity incident where attackers were able to steal 2.4 million customer records. Records. These records include things like your name, email, uh, date of birth, some of your banking information, and in some cases your credential information, whether they're hashed or not hashed, and maybe even 90,000 pieces of encrypted credit card information. Long story short, if you're a car phone customer or a customer of one of their many online e-tailers or some of the communication companies associated with them like TalkTalk, you might want to be concerned with this breach. The first thing you need to do is change your password. Then be on the lookout for an email telling you about this breach. If you get one, you may want to inform your uh, bank of this breach and some potential illicit activity and also monitor your credit card. As always, the main advice for this type of breach is you really need to maintain password security best practices. This means using different passwords everywhere. Otherwise, this breach means you may have to change all your passwords if you happen to use the same password in other places. Of course, remembering lots of strong passwords is almost infeasible for a human, so I highly recommend a good password manager. By the way, one note to this story, TalkTalk, which is a company associated with Carphone, also had some of their customers' data stolen. And surprisingly, Increasingly, they stored passwords unhashed, potentially in clear text. This means it's very easy for these attackers to potentially use these TalkTalk passwords. So if you're a TalkTalk customer, you may want to be on the lookout for one of these breach notification letters. Anyways, this was just an interesting breach that affects our friends across the pond, which I thought I would highlight. But you should also look out for me to cover some of the Black Hat stories I missed from last week. Tuesday's story is Thunderstrike 2, a MacBook firmware worm. This actually is one of the stories that comes out of last week's Black Hat and DEF CON security conferences. A research team led by Tramel Hudson showed a number of vulnerabilities that could allow attackers to infect a Thunderbolt device, which could then infect other MacBook uh, computers. And a lot of this really had to do with vulnerabilities in your firmware. Uh, basically, your motherboard runs a firmware. You might have heard it being called a BIOS, or more recently, they call it EFI, the Extensible Firmware Interface, or even most recently, UEFI, or the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. In a nutshell, this is software your motherboard uses to boot a computer. It's the first thing that boots on your computer before it even loads the operating system from your hard drive. So essentially, here's how the researcher's uh, proof of concept attack worked. First, this this whole attack could actually start like a normal malware attack, one you might get in a drive-by download or an email where a user accidentally installs some malicious software. And this attack used a root privilege escalation vulnerability that affects MacBooks, which was found a while ago, that could allow them to uh, load specialized software in a special section of a Thunderbolt device, something called the Options ROM. And once the software was in the Options ROM, the next time the MacBook rebooted and went to sleep or whatever, it could actually load the infection on the firmware of your MacBook using a number of tricks. And then your MacBook's firmware would be infected until you actually reflashed the firmware. And this is pretty serious because traditional anti-malware products don't scan the firmware of your laptop. They only scan the hard drive in your memory. So it's much harder to find firmware malware. Even if you change your hard drive or totally reinstall the operating system, the firmware malware will reload it. What's also interesting is the Thunderbolt device is also infected forever. That means if you share that Thunderbolt device with other Mac 
MacBooks, you would infect them as well. So this is one way a sophisticated attacker might get past the air gap network. And a lot of this has to do with vulnerabilities in the EFI or the actual motherboard firmware. Intel actually makes the EFI or UFI firmware that many different vendors use. So it's a very common code base. And according to these presenters, Apple actually forked an older version of EFI a while ago. So one of the big takeaways here, one of the big protections, is not something you can do as a consumer. It's something that the OEMs and the vendors have to do, which is essentially keep up with the patches and the security fixes to this firmware software that Intel puts out. It's very, very important. Another good takeaway for vendors out there is the fact that Intel has offered some new security mechanisms that allow them to maybe do things like check the flash and have it signed and make sure that malicious flash doesn't get loaded. So vendors really need to start taking advantage of that. There's really no practical takeaway for average consumers out there. They just need to hope that the vendors solve the problem. I will say if you are a more technical consumer, the researchers mentioned that you can do forensics on your own firmware. For instance, they plan on releasing tools that might help you check the validity of the firmware you're running on your MacBook or your Windows or other PC devices out there. In any case, I've glossed over a lot of the technical details concerning a number of vulnerabilities the researchers used for this particular attack. If you're a more technical person that is interested in that, be sure to check out the blog post associated with this video. I'll give you a link to the annotated version of this presentation, which is very interesting. Wednesday's story is August patch day. There's a lot of interesting security stories today, but I want to focus on the biggest patch day for August. That's because yesterday was Microsoft Patch Tuesday, and Adobe also shares Patch Tuesday. On top of that, Mozilla also released a big Firefox update. No time to go into all the technical details, but here's the important stuff. Microsoft released 14 security bulletins fixing many, many vulnerabilities in a lot of their products. All versions of Windows are affected, Internet Explorer, some of the Windows components like Remote Desktop Protocol, Microsoft Office is affected, Silverlight, and Link. So if you have any of those Microsoft updates, you're going to want to patch. And by the way, three of these vulnerabilities or bulletins uh, fix critical vulnerabilities. So it's pretty important you go out and patch if you're a Microsoft administrator. Also, Adobe released a patch as well. They fixed a number of critical vulnerabilities in Adobe Flash. Not everyone has Flash, but I bet a majority of you do. So if you use Adobe Flash, you definitely want to go update that. Finally, if you happen to use Mozilla's Firefox browser, it fixed over 40 vulnerabilities as well, so be sure to update that. By the way, here's my simple advice for patching. Client computers, desktop computers that your normal clients use, you should use auto-patching mechanisms. Windows, Adobe, and even browsers like Firefox have settings where they can automatically download download and install updates in the background. And while there are some issues with installing updates automatically, maybe they can hurt your systems in some cases, these are very, very minor. And for desktop systems, it's probably worth the risk to keep your clients up to date all the time. Now for production servers, any servers that you have running that are very important to the business, those you may not want to auto update. So any big Windows servers out there, you probably want to test these patches before updating. And in any case, a lot of new patches out there. So if you use Microsoft Adobe products or if you use Mozilla's Firefox, go get the updates. Thursday's story is the car hacking revolution has begun. You probably remember a few weeks ago when I talked about the latest car hack, Jeep Cherokee's Uconnect system was proven vulnerable by two security researchers who previewed uh, their actual hack to Wired magazine and talked about what they were going to disclose at Black Hat. Well, as you know, Black Hat has come and gone, and the first update to car hacking is the fact that you can now get the full paper on Charlie Miller and Chris Velasek's Uconnect uh, or Jeep Cherokee car hack. I won't go into a ton of detail on this, but be sure to check out the blog post associated with this video. The white paper is a fascinating read. They talk about how the actual wireless access point in this system was a actual weakness. They talk about how there was a certain port that was listening even on the public carrier network that this car was on. And they basically show you how they found vulnerabilities in a number of systems to eventually get to the car's ECUs or the car's network and the other computers it uses. But the reason I'm talking about a car hacking revolution was that was only one of many automotive attacks that were at Black Hat and other security conferences this week. 
There's also a story about how researchers found vulnerabilities in Tesla's Model S car. I won't go into a ton of detail, but researchers did find vulnerabilities that allowed them to gain control of a Tesla Model S car too. Now there's some good news here. First of all, the researchers said Tesla's Model S was a little more challenging to hack. It didn't seem quite as easy as some of the stuff found in the Uconnect system. Furthermore, Tesla has already fixed this vulnerability and they took advantage of a very important mechanism to do this. Apparently, Tesla's Model S supports over-the-air updates for its infotainment and GPS system. So this means when there is a flaw, Tesla doesn't need to recall the car, they can actually push updates to their customers. At another security conference called USENIX, there's also some interesting research on an attack against the insurance dongles you can put in your automobiles. Maybe your insurance company has asked you to plug one of these in to lower your premiums, but when you have this plugged in, they can monitor your speed and stuff like that and of course it calls home to your insurance company and shares that information. Now this of course connects to your car's network and it also connects to a carrier to send this data over the internet and these researchers showed how they could take advantage of this flaw to specifically uh, force the brakes on a Corvette simply by sending a specialized text message. So kind of a scary flaw. But again this one has good news compared to the Jeep Cherokee issue because even these dongles allow for over-the-air updates. And lastly, there is just one other interesting car hacking story, more for the legal issues around it. Apparently, two years ago, researchers found vulnerabilities in the specialized chips and tokens that Volkswagen can use to start cars. You're probably familiar with digital key fobs. Well, apparently there's chips in Volkswagen's key fob and in the car that if Volkswagen doesn't sense the key in proximity, it won't allow you to start your car. Anyways, two years ago, researchers found out how to defeat this system, but apparently Volkswagen sued them so they couldn't actually disclose this research until two years later. So anyway, as you can see, there's a ton of researchers focusing on car hacks, which means there's probably some black hat threat actors focusing on them as well. Now for car hacks, there's really no strong consumer takeaways other than updating. Hopefully your manufacturers will implement over the air updates, because I doubt the average consumer is going to go through a whole lot of rigmarole to patch their car. Friday's story is a mysterious new attack on Cisco iOS devices. This week, Cisco released an advisory warning that customers were finding an attack on their iOS devices. Long story short, Cisco warns that there were some devices found that had the ROMMON image replaced with a malicious one. ROMMON is basically the iOS bootstrap image, the thing that helps boot your router. And if a bad guy can actually gain access to your router and replace this with a malicious firmware image, it pretty much gives him persistence on your router. Even when you reboot the device, he can relaunch any of his malicious malicious attacks on the device itself. Now, according to the advisory, there's no vulnerability here. Apparently, the attackers have somehow already had administrative privileges or credentials for these routers. And one of the things an administrator can uh, legitimately do is rewrite this ROMMON image. Now, there's really no clue how uh, the attackers have gained uh, administrative credentials on these devices. So that's currently unknown. In fact, this particular advisory doesn't share a whole lot of detail. They don't really share how how big the impact is. According to uh, their rating, it's a medium impact, but I would expect if a bad guy can actually have a administrative level piece of firmware on your router, he pretty much owns your network. So anyways, if you're a Cisco person, you need to be aware of this. That said, there's no patch to apply. Uh, if I were to give you some tips, first of all, you might want to make sure you have a very strong password on your Cisco iOS devices. On top of that, uh, I'll post a link to Cisco's advisory. They recommend some ways you can harden your router and there are ways to check the integrity of the ROMMON image to make sure it hasn't been replaced with a malicious one. Well that's all I have for you this week. I hope you found it interesting and educational. By the way, last week was Black Hat and DEF CON and as a result this was an extremely uh, busy news week with many many other stories I never had a chance to cover. So I really highly recommend you check out the blog post associated with this video. As always there will be a reference section but this week there will be a list of many other really interesting security stories 
stories that you might want to check out. And as always, you can find that blog post at blog.watchguard.com or at watchguardsecuritycenter.com. And be sure to subscribe to that if you want email messages when I update the videos. Also, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. And you can also subscribe to the YouTube channel if you want the video as soon as I post them. Finally, if you're enjoying the Mr. Robot series as much as I am, be sure to head over to GeekWire to check out my latest analysis of the hacks in this week's episode. As always, thanks for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.